thank you. Thank you all for coming. And welcome to the Washington Institute. The <coughs> past 20 days, Lebanon has witnessed uh, unprecedented protests around the country. The Lebanese people took to the streets to say no. No to corruption, no to sectarianism, and eventually no to non-state militias. This is not the first protest Lebanon has ever witnessed at such a large scale. But it is very different from previous ones. One, it is non-sectarian. People only held the Lebanese flags. There was no sign of any party flags anywhere in the country, except for the pro-president protests that held the Tayyar flag. People only talked about Lebanon. The political parties, the political leaders, the politicians, they were unable, whether they are pro-government uh, or opposition, they were incapable, no matter how they tried, to infiltrate the streets or to carry their agendas to the streets. But most importantly, there was no influence whatsoever from local actors, regional actors, or international actors. This has never happened in Lebanon before. It is truly Lebanese and has created an earthquake in Lebanon that everybody's try still trying to grab their head around it. And that is why people in Lebanon uh, have, are starting to call it the revolution, the Lebanese revolution. It started as the Lebanese protests, then the trending hashtag moved into a Lebanese uprising, and that now the most trending hashtag is Lebanon revolution because it is truly a revolution. It has started with cries against corruption and the failing economy in the country. However, today it's much, much more than that. It is about a system that has been in place for the past 30 years, since the, since the end of the Civil War. It is about the corrupt politicians, and not just because they are corrupt, it's about these politicians who have been placed in the system since the Civil War. They were the warlords of uh, the Lebanese Civil War, and then they became the political leaders. And the system has put them in place and helped uh, maintain the corruption. So it's really about that. It's about everything that happened to Lebanon since the Civil War took place. The transition is going to be very, very difficult and very challenging. Because simply the authority today, even after the resignation of Prime Minister Saad al-Hariri, is not going to let go without a fight. The authority today, and I mean Hezbollah, who has won the elections in 2018 and have formed this government that has now resigned, they still have the parliament and they still have their president. And they're not going to let go easily. And a proper transition to... A, uh, to, to, to a transitional government, a technocratic government, an independent government that is going to hold early elections, representational uh, electoral law, and a new president is not going to happen very simply. It's a long, long fight, and it will have a lot of challenges. However, there are three main important outcomes. People feel that the civil war is finally over. This generation who started these revolutions are, is a generation that did not experience the civil war. This is a generation that, whose weapon is actually the smartphone against the real weapons of the civil war. The people today in the street did not grow up with the ideology and the rhetoric of the civil war. This is, people actually feel that the civil war is actually over in terms of the street rhetoric. There's no longer a Sunni street versus a Shia street versus a Christian street. Today we are looking at the Lebanese street. And they have a unified rhetoric, unified demands, and it's very clear. They want a transitional system, a transitional government that would call for early elections, a non-sectarian electoral law that would produce a new parliament and a new president. Everyone all over the place is saying the same thing. But the major outcome, I think, if you think about the authority, who the authority today in Lebanon, although still armed to the teeth and still has the parliament and the president, 
Hezbollah has lost most of the pillars that support this power. And we're talking here about four main pillars. Two of the main allies of Hezbollah today have been destroyed in the street. Speaker of the Parliament and Amal leader Nabih Berri, Foreign Minister and the head of the uh, FPM, for, uh, the, the son-in-law of the President, is also a Hezbollah ally. These two people have been criticized mostly in the street. Hezbollah's two main allies have been politically killed in the street. The second pillar that Hezbollah has lost is the Shia community. If you follow the protests, the map of the protests, you can tell that despite the intimidation and despite the violence that has been used against the Shia protesters in Shia strongholds like Nabatiyyeh and Sur and Balbat, people are still in the street. And Hezbollah, they cannot use their violence to, get to, to bring them back home. The Shia community is no longer uh, under Hezbollah's umbrella. They're out. The third pillar that Hezbollah has lost is the Christian cover. The Christian streets are out. The president and the, and the foreign minister, who is Hezbollah's main ally, is also been, he, they lost legitimacy. Gibran Basile can no longer dream of becoming the president of Lebanon today. He is not going to be a legitimate one. Last but not least, the last pillar that Hezbollah has lost is the international commu community's cover, represented by Hariri. And that's why Hezbollah really wanted Hariri to be the prime minister in 2018, because Hariri can maintain the international cover. He can actually talk to the Americans and the French and the Saudis. Maybe not the Saudis, <laughs> but <laughs> to a certain extent. So without Hariri today, we'll see if Hariri returns or not. The speakers will tell us more about this. But with Hariri resigning, also Hezbollah feels that they have lost the international cover. So these four pillars are actually what Hezbollah lost today. How is Hezbollah going to respond? What is the process today that we are witnessing in terms of forming the new government? Is the street going to continue? What are the main demands? And why is this important to us? We have three speakers today to discuss all these issues. An economist, a historian, and an activist. We're gonna start with Makram Rabah, who is a lecturer of history at the American University of Beirut and a lead consultant with quantum communications. Makram has moved his classes from the American University of Beirut to the streets, and he will tell us a, a little bit about this, this dynamic. And then we move to Luqman Islim, who is a director of Hayya Bina and Umam, a Lebanese organization that focuses on Shia politics and social dynamics. And last but not least, Jean Tawili, who is the president of the Kitab Economic and Social Council and a board member of the Lebanese Businessmen Association and the Lebanese Association <coughs> of Taxpayer Rights. He's a renowned economist and he can tell us a little bit about how the economy uh, is looking today in Lebanon, how the central bank is responding, foreign reserves, et cetera, and what are we facing in terms of economy. I'd like to start with Makram. Can you uh, give us your overview? And then we move to the next uh, second and third speakers, and then we will open the floor to Q&A. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Hanin. Thank you, everyone, for attending. This is a great pleasure that I'm speaking to, uh, to you today, particularly a lot of friends in the room. Uh, this revolution, which is certainly a revolution, and this is something not only unprecedented, but really very hard to understand. Uh, I've been active for the last 20 years. I've been active in the 2005 Cedar Revolution. This is different. This is different because simply we are dealing with a new breed of activists. And all of a sudden, this so-called clientless system, which had worked for the last maybe 100 years, has, has collapsed over the heads of the people who previously used to, uh, to abuse it. Many of the people I saw on the streets are people who formerly used to ask for favors from me and from our connections in government. These people, in a way, realized that this clientless system can no longer cater for them. And I don't think that these people are looking towards, not all of them are endorsing a kind of a secular, uh, modern state, but they certainly want a system that works. And my personal impression is that they realized that after the international community 
as well as the regional powers, particularly the Gulf states, uh, the Sa Saudi Arabia, as well as em uh, the United Arab Emirates, have forsaken Lebanon. They felt that there was no no chance of economic recovery. And thus, they were fully aware that this alliance between Hariri and Basil, as well as the uh, hegemony of Hezbollah over all aspects of Lebanese governance, they went to the streets in a way to uh, peacefully fight Hezbollah. It was basically like someone being raped. Uh, they decided to basically stop enjoying it. And this is something which people do not talk about, but they do it. Uh, they do it with the impression that this is the only way that we can bring Lebanon back from this international and this regional isolation. I told my students when I took them down to downtown Beirut that I teach history, but now we are making history. And ironically, I was teaching uh, before the revolution broke out. I started teaching about the 1958 civil war that started here. And as you know, it was something that involved the Americans landing. In this revolution, and I'm thankful that the Trump administration is not on our side. If the Trump administration was on our side, we would have been sold out at the first chance. The international community, particularly the United Nations, as well as France in particular, are collaborating and are complicit actors with Saad al-Hariri as well as Jubran Basil, and indirectly they are helping out Hezbollah. Uh, this is the case because the current government is using the Erdogan tactic of scaring uh, the Europeans by reminding them that we have the Syrian refugees here and any chaos and any vacuum would eventually lead uh, to their exodus and to them crossing the Mediterranean. On the streets, I have seen people change. I have seen people and I've seen young men and women actually attack Hezbollah when we were attacked last time. I saw people rushing to the streets when I went live on Facebook and I asked people to come to Riyadh Salah and to Martha Square because I knew and I had information that uh, uh, the army as well as the police force will do nothing when we are attacked. I also felt that Hariri as well as Ibrahim Basil along with Hezbollah, they orchestrated this so-called attack. Regardless of what happened, what's happening today, and I have been asked this every day, what will happen? Will this revolution falter? Will we be able to stand? I am very optimistic. I'm very optimistic simply not because we have plans and we have a clear roadmap in front of us, but because we know that the ruling establishment are just trying to weasel their way out of this. And unfortunately, they have started to, uh, to seize the local media as well as in a way that the international media is helping them achieve this. I am fully aware that the news cycle now in the US is all about the impeachment and any mention of the revolution in Lebanon, unfortunately, is being misconstrued as a, simply an act of rebellion against economic uh, corruption. This is not about economic corruption. People want a new economic system and people are willing to wait. The only downside here that just like our local politicians scare us from Hezbollah's weapons. Hezbollah don't intimidate people. The people who are being intimidated are being intimidated by their own people, be it Hariri, Jaja, or Jumlat. They use the idea of Hezbollah has weapons to justify their complicity with the system. All of them means all of them. This is a very essential credo, very simple, very straightforward. And ultimately, people might be tired. They might be somewhat uh, disenchanted by the fact that this revolution did not yield any direct uh, outcomes. But in general, I think uh, people will not go home soon. My students at least will not stop demonstrating. And the people who are closing these roads are not trained militiamen. I have seen my own students wake up at four in the morning, go close roads and then go back, take a nap and then join us in Martyr Square. We are looking at a new breed of politicians, a new breed of activists, and we are also looking at a Lebanese people who want to celebrate the next centennial. As you are well aware, we are celebrating Lebanon's centennial, and this centennial hasn't been all filled with joyous occasions. We cannot move forward by allowing Hezbollah to stay in government as is. We cannot allow Hezbollah to claim that it is a political party and use, uh, use the government and the economy to shield itself from American sanctions. 
Last time I attended a lecture, a lot of people were, were saying that the maximum pressure campaign is not working. I invite all these people to join us in Beirut and to see that this is actually working and to actually see that the support of the U.S. government to the Lebanese army is actually working, despite all the campaigns against the Lebanese army. And I personally do not believe that the army should intervene in politics, but the army so far, despite the shortcomings and despite some instances which they were not able to stand strong, they are still functioning and they are still preventing Hezbollah from totally taking over, or at least they are protecting our right to demonstrate. Today, for example, there is a very, today, this day, we saw the army becoming very brutish and trying to remove people uh, by force. I think every politician, particularly Jubran Basile and Hariri yesterday, they met in secret and they agreed to start bullying people. Uh, the response to this is that people are becoming more and more stronger. I am not as optimistic about the uh, secularization of the state as, as uh, Hanin mentioned and the fact that people are intrinsically still sectarian and tribal. But still, they know that their tribalism or their sect will not be uh, protected by the current political system. And in a way, they are now no longer willing to trust in their co corrupt political class. They are willing to accept this corrupt political class in case they do like uh, people with substance abuse do. They have to publicly say that we have a problem. Second, they have to take the second step and ask for help. And then they have to prove that they are being reformed. This is something up until today, uh, many of our politicians are still living at the Cold War. And unfortunately, they are used to American foreign policy and getting instructions from, uh, from their embassy here or from the State Department. The State Department, uh, unfortunately, in its last statement, has I couldn't understand what this statement was about. The current problem in Lebanon that no one cares about what the Americans think or the American administration think. As opposed to 2005, when we were to go down to the streets, we always cared about what the foreign powers wanted in Lebanon. Simply, an 18-year-old who is blocking a main highway in Lebanon is more influential than Donald Trump, and thank God for that. Uh, I think this is a long fight. This is a fight to remind everyone that we cannot talk about reform in a toxic environment. We cannot talk about reform in a country uh, dominated by Hezbollah and Hassan Nasrullah. Last time Hassan Nasrullah, when he went on TV, all of a sudden he was talking about fighting corruption and reform. Then he said, listen, don't, th don't think that we are weak. Don't think that we don't have uh, our capabilities and don't think that we cannot pay. We can't make payroll. My impression was, who asked you about, about this? Why are you talking this? He reminded me of this joke of uh, this, uh, this guy on drugs. He was stopped by, by the police and he was telling them, could I get your papers, sir? And then all of a sudden, I said, who talked about drugs? I don't have drugs on me. So this guy does not realize that this is not about his weapons. His weapons he can use to bully people, but he cannot take over the country as he plans. A security-minded outfit such as Hezbollah, even if they have the help and the assistance of degenerate politicians such as, such as Jubran Basile cannot bully all the people all the time. And more importantly, I invite you not to focus on Beirut, focus on Nabati, the stronghold of Hezbollah, focus on Tripoli, which was accused previously of being the Afghanistan of Lebanon and the Kandahar of Lebanon, with all due respect. Focus on Saida, focus on the Biqa. It is not a centralized revolution. This is a revolution which has been decentralized or, or either, even went as far as becoming a federalized revolution. More importantly, look at the diaspora. People who are demonstrating across the globe uh, particularly are sending a clear message, I think, and this is very important. And more importantly, the issue of not having a political direction or having a head to lead this is actually the reason why it has still survived. The DNA of the revolution is like quicksand. Anyone who tries to ride the revolution will be sucked in. And I think one of the most important counter-revolution now at the moment is the toxic part of the to part of the civil society who are opportunistic and who are thinking of collaborating with the existing political establishment in order to refuse the revolution and convince people that simple economic reforms are the way out. The only way for Lebanon to survive is to reclaim its soul and to basically tell Hezbollah or anyone who believes that an AK-47 
is the way forward that men and women who are attacking their hooligans in Beirut should get this protection as well as the support of the international community because Lebanon has proven that it is not yet a full hostage of Iran nor of any other faction who wants to take over this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Makram. I'm going to come back to you with a few questions later. Uh, Lukman, the floor is yours. Hi. Thank you, Hanin. Good afternoon. Uh, actually, <clears throat> I will be perhaps more cautious than Hanin and uh, than my friend Makram. I don't know if what's happening is a revolution or if it's not. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, exclusively a Lebanese uh, uprising or not, and therefore I think that we need to put things a little bit in context and in perspective. Uh, obviously, what started in October 17 is Lebanese in a way, but we cannot deny also the fact that in a lot of its feature, features, it's a kind of mimicking in a way or reproduction of the Arab Spring. And I think that we need to take into consideration uh, this feature because it leads us to uh, understand also that in 2019, a new generation of Lebanese is discovering uh, politics and is uh, claiming its, its part within it. And I think that in the long term, what will remain or the residual uh, dynamic of what's happening right now in the streets is this kind of uh, generational conflict, uh, which is uh, asking for a secular state, etc., for a modern state. Uh, the third, perhaps, key, uh, which was mentioned in Hanin's presentation and which was mentioned also by Makram is the Shia factor. And I think that it's a tricky one, especially right now where uh, the streets of uh, Baghdad and Karbala and Najaf are also witnessing uh, demonstrations and where we see and hear uh, overt anti-Iranian slogans. Uh, I will perhaps take more time trying to uh, decode what's happening in the first in the Shia milieu uh, before uh, passing to other issues. I think that you know we need to we don't we should refrain from falling in the temptation of easily comparing what's happening in Beirut and in Shiastan, in Sur, Nabatiye, Baalbek, North Beka, to what's happening in, uh, in Iraq. It's not that there is no similarities, but I think that there is some local dynamics which could hopefully join the Iraqi dynamics, but it's too early to say that what's happening in Lebanon is exactly similar to what's happening in Iraq. You know, obviously, it was surprising for Hezbollah to see people uh, in some of its strongholds going in the streets and uh, uh, going overtly and accusing its main ally, which is the Amal movement, of being uh, a component of the Lebanese corruption and accusing Hezbollah also of protecting, finally, uh, this ally and hence being part of the big uh, corruption machinery. But I think that uh, what we saw and continue to see uh, in the in Shia Stan, Lebanon has uh, some more uh, deep causes. Perhaps the most important of these causes is the involvement of Hezbollah and 
uh, its implication of the Shia community in the Syrian uh, conflict. This involvement, which was depicted at a certain moment as a kind of uh, defensive action by Hezbollah defending Lebanon and defending the Shia, uh, ended up with a kind of uh, fiasco as we know now. It's true that Bashar al-Assad is still in office, but finally the dividend of this, uh, of this intervention uh, weren't really felt as a quote-unquote Shia victory. A second factor which I think encouraged a lot of people to go out is this kind of malaise which is felt by uh, the leftist Shia tradition, uh, the left which is deeply rooted in the Shia milieu vis-à-vis -vis Hezbollah which hijacked at a certain moment the idea of resisting occupation. So. Starting from October 17, we saw also all these uh, groupings of leftists who felt at a certain moment frustrated of their resistance by the Hezbollah going out and uh, driving people uh, behind them. I think that uh, and we can see it today with the uh, serial defections happening in the Al-Akhbar newspaper. Uh, so far, five journalists have uh, resigned. Uh, a fourth uh, factor which drove uh, the Shia out in the streets is finally the corruption. Hezbollah and Amal as are simply as corrupt partners in the Lebanese uh, oligarchy as the others are. You know, and perhaps uh, over the last years, this was the talk, uh, this was said behind closed doors. For the first time, we hear it aloud. But I think that the corruption factor uh, either enabled or protected by both Amal and Hezbollah uh, is a very important uh, one. Uh, a fifth factor which needs to be taken into consideration is the fact that Hezbollah is part of the Lebanese uh, uh, government since 2005. Since 2005, when the Syrian army left Lebanon, Hezbollah decided to join the cabinet. So 15 years later, uh, Hezbollah cannot pretend that it was just uh, <coughs> mobilizing its uh, effort uh, uh, in resisting. And obviously, the fifth factor which drove the Shia in the streets uh, is the financial and economic hardship that Hezbollah is going through thanks to the sanctions. So. This is a key factor which, as Makram said, happened uh, luckily outside any quote-unquote manipulation or any uh, help. Obviously, Hezbollah couldn't sustain uh, things like this and therefore, starting from the second or third day of this uh, popular surge, it started demonizing demonstrators, accusing some of them of being uh, uh, of, of implementing uh, uh, agenda, foreign agendas, and finally this uh, trend grew over the last uh, two weeks, and from uh, just accusing in general. What we are seeing now in some Shia areas is uh, overt intimidation. People are intimidated in the literal sense of the word. Some people are even uh, are even uh, threatened to lose their jobs uh, and all kind of uh, threats. Uh, this takes me to talk a little bit about the performance of the LAF during these last weeks. I would say that uh, starting 
the, the, the popular surge which started in October 17 was a, an opportunity for the LAF to showcase its weakness and its strengths, its good side and its, let's say, uh, dark sides. But while, for example, we saw the LAF in, uh, at some moments in Beirut mainly and in Mount Lebanon protecting protesters and guaranteeing their safety while the LAF was overtly accused by some politicians of even uh, over-nursing protesters in Tripoli. The same didn't happen at all in the south where we saw uh, either paramilitary groups or municipal uh, police uh, belonging to some municipalities controlled by Amal and Hezbollah beating up and even lynching some protesters. And I think that this is an important point because it shows also where finally any eventual uh, assistance to the LAF should go or should not go. The LAF, after these three last weeks, I think, and proved how much it is likely to be reformed, but also proved how much within it there is resistance in a way to uh, reform and to behave as the uh, national institution, cross-confessional, blah, blah, blah. Uh, among uh, other things which were really very, uh, which were and seen very clearly is, for example, the behavior of some officers who, instead of uh, implementing orders coming from their commandment, were just uh, indulging uh, Amal and Hezbollah to, owe, to whom they owe either their promotion or even uh, the fact that they belong today to uh, the LAF. Similarly, uh, the role of the intelligence of the army, the Mukhabarat al-Jaysh, is very questionable. Uh, in various parts of Shiaistan, people and, uh, felt that uh, this, uh, uh, this office was finally uh, helping Amal and Hezbollah rather than uh, implementing what the army promised in terms of protecting uh, protest protesters. Uh, what uh, does all this? Sorry. Okay, you have one, one or two more minutes maximum. And not just one minute. I would like to draw one conclusion, um, which is, you know, now protesters are claiming early elections. Obviously, early elections would be a very good uh, uh, news. But I think that what we saw happening in Shiaistan, in the regions controlled by Amal and Hezbollah, should make us think carefully about holding early elections under this regime of oppression. So perhaps what we need is not only elections, but we need perhaps to think outside the box, even to think at perhaps revisiting the mandate of the UNIFIL so that it doesn't uh, secure only uh, the Lebanese-Israeli border, but it secure also the, uh, the daily life of those living uh, in the region which it controls. Obviously, uh, expanding the mandate of the UNIFIL would be also a welcome news. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we'll come back to you, Lokman, with more questions, so please stay with us. Uh, Jean, please go ahead. Yes. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, I will be sharing with you a presentation. So I'll just make sure that it's working. If Hanin, is it working? Yes, it is. 
Yes, go ahead. We can see you and the presentation. Okay, amazing. Okay, so first of all, what is the status of our economy? So Lebanon is, uh, Lebanon is today living in a stagflation mode. As we can see the uh, left side uh, graph, the real GDP growth in 2017 uh, can you can you raise your voice a little bit? We 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 need. Uh, can, can you shout? Can you hear me better now? A little bit more. Uh, is it Volume. better? Yes. Okay. Thanks. I'll try. Okay, so I'll 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 talk like this. Is it okay? Yes. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So as we can see on the left uh, side graph. We can see the real GDP growth in, since 2007 in Lebanon. Uh, we can see how since 2011, the real GDP growth fell from uh, an average of uh, 8 to 10% to uh, an average of 2%, with a GDP growth in 2019 uh, expected to be close to zero, and even uh, we are even talking of a recession uh, for the year of 2019. Uh, and this is coming with a very high inflation rate. In 2018, the inflation ra rate was at 6.1 percent, while in 2019, we are expecting a very high inflation rate of 10 percent, and even some, uh, some analysis are even expecting more than 15 percent. And this inflation is mainly due to two things. Uh, first of all, in the budget of 2019, the government uh, included some protectionism uh, measures on imported goods. The main idea in this protection measures was to increase the revenues of the state. However, this obviously have impacted the prices and accompanied with something else, which is the, the scarcity of dollars in circulation in Lebanon, which, is le which led to a uh, devaluation. And on this point, I'm going to develop more of this point later on in my presentation. But this led to a secondary market for the Lebanese lira. As, as you know, the Lebanese lira in Lebanon, one dollar is equal to 1,500 uh, Lebanese lira. And it's been this, uh, the same since 1995 almost. However, now there is a secondary market and uh, as we speak today, the secondary market is pricing the, the, the $1 at $1,700. Uh, and this led, obviously, to an increase of, of the goods in circulation in Lebanon. But at this point, I'm going to develop it later on because it's a very important point. So the stagflation uh, situation in Lebanon is accompanied, is accompanied with a large twin deficits. And from one side, we have a very large fiscal deficit. And from the other side, we have also a very large deficit in the balance of payments. I'm going to start, first of all, with a very large fiscal deficit. So regarding the fiscal deficit in Lebanon, we are currently in a vicious cycle. The cycle starts with an increase in the fiscal deficit, as we can see in this slide. So the fiscal deficit increased by more than 100% since 2014. In 2014, the fiscal deficit was at $3 billion, while today, in 2018, the fiscal deficit exceeded $6.2 billion, or 11% uh, of GDP. Now, obviously, this fiscal deficit, how do we finance it? We finance it by increasing our debt, by raising debt. And here we can see clearly how the debt has increased. Debt has increased, than the, has increased by more than 50 percent, uh, by, by more than 25 percent since 2015. And we are today, the public debt is at 160 percent of GDP, uh, the third highest in the world after uh, Greece and, uh, and Japan. Now, this, how do we, how are we, be able, how Lebanon is financing its debt? Today, the Lebanese debt is held at 90% by the banking sector. The banking sector is financing the debt of Lebanon by increasing interest rates, as we can see in this graph, 
We can see how rates have increased in blue for the USD and in green for the Lebanese Lira. We are increasing interest rates in order to attract more deposits into the country. And through these deposits, we are being able to finance the government. However, this is the high price you have to pay for it. Because by increasing interest rates, that's true that you are attracting deposits, but in the same time, we are uh, decreasing the loans to the private sector. There is a deleveraging that is happening today in the, in the, in the private sector. And we can see that in 2019, until today, we are almost at minus 6% of loans to the private sector. So obviously, there is no loans to the private sector. The whole private sector is, in, uh, is, is, is facing challenges and is in difficulty. There is a rise in layoffs and bankruptcies. And obviously, this uh, would eventually uh, lead to less taxes and revenues, fiscal revenues for the government, while at the same time, the expenditures are still increasing year after year, which will lead to, again, an increase in the fiscal deficit. And this is, again, the, uh, the current vicious cycle that the, pub the, the, the fiscal deficit and the public finance in, is going through from one side. However, the most important point is as well, and what we're going to talk about is the balance of payments. The balance of payments historically was always positive in Lebanon. It was always positive in Lebanon until 2011, where the balance of payments turned negative. In 2018, we had the highest yearly balance of payment deficit of $4.8 billion. However, in 2019, the balance of payments went negative with a deficit of $5.4 billion for only the first six months of the year. So for those who don't know, the balance of payments, if, in a very simplistic way, it's how much dollars or hard currencies or foreign currency is getting out of the country and how much is getting in and what is the balance. So since 2011, we have more dollars and hard currency getting out of the country than, uh, than uh, currencies getting in. So why, why is that? First of all, because we have an increase year after year of our trade deficit, which is uh, in 2018 reached $17 billion from one side. We have, we're not exporting our uh, productive economy and our economy, the local economy, is losing its all, all its competitiveness because of lack of reforms, because of a lack of vision, of economic vision, because of the corruption, because of, all the, of, of the political instability and insecurity, and uh, of course, of, and, 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 and the Syrian crisis is not helping as well in this, in this sense. So from one side, we always had a, a, a balance, a trade deficit that is negative, that is growing year after year. And on the other side, we have a balance of capital that, you, that is always positive because of the huge diaspora of, the, of, of, of Lebanon abroad, because of the, uh, the increase of interest rates, which help us eventually bring back some deposits into the country. Uh, however, this... This growth in the deposits is currently insufficient. And we can see that in 2019, while we used to have an increase of an average of between 6 and 8% of the, the deposits in Lebanon, we can see that in, in 2019, for the first time, there is no more deposit in the growth. We are below 0% in the deposit of the growth. And all this, what it, what it, all this are leading to something, and this is the graph that I will be spending a little bit of time on. These are the foreign currencies. A little bit of time, Jean. We just I'm a little bit of time because the, we need we need to go to Q and A later. Okay, it's my two last slides. Okay. Uh, so these are the foreign currency reserves. So as I was saying before, the balance of payment, when it used to be positive, it allowed us to increase this, these foreign currencies. However, uh, and uh, the increase of interest rates helped us as well to 
uh, with the foreign deposits and the deposits coming into Lebanon uh, was allowing us to increase these foreign currencies. However, we can see that in 2016, at the end of 2015 and the beginning of 2016, there was a, a, a big decrease in the foreign currencies in Lebanon. And that's when uh, the Central Bank of Lebanon, the, the BDL, for the first time they did the financial engineer, which led to a big increase in interest rates and a big attraction of deposits, which allowed us to increase again the foreign currencies. However, since 2018, we can see that the foreign currencies are getting lower and lower and lower, and there is no more room for the central bank to increase interest rates and to attract more deposits to allow these, currencies, these foreign currencies to continue. And again, these foreign currencies are being used in the same time to be able to stabilize the Lebanese lira at $1, $1 equal 1,500 Lebanese lira. And that's why, since our foreign currency reserves are, are melting, are decreasing big time, the central bank had to take some exceptional measures before even the people going, to the, uh, going on the street and protesting, where they, they had to stop and to take measures at the, at the banks, uh, not allowing everyone to be able to do all their uh, foreign currencies exchange and pushing for a, for a secondary, secondary market in the Lebanese lira to happen, which led to the devaluation that I was talking about in the beginning of my slide. So today, banks are uh, having difficulties, especially after the protest. Today, there is a kind of disguised capital control. Banks are not allowing uh, customers, not even traders, not even the private sector, to get the money out of the country because of this foreign currencies that are melting. Uh, they are putting restrictions on Lebanese people to withdraw uh, any dollars that they need to get, to, to get out of the country or to, to get out of the, of, the, of the bank to be able to keep them with them. And, and this is the current situation. So what is needed? There is an urgency today to, be, to a government to be formed as soon as possible. There is no more time, and each day, each, each minute, and each second that is passing, people are, are going to the banks, are retrieving their money, and the foreign currency re reserves are melting more and more. This government has three objectives. One, it should gain the trust. It should gain the trust of the Lebanese people, and it should gain the trust of the international community. This government should be a uh, a, a, a government uh, ready to work together uh, for the benefit of the country and to put aside all their own uh, benefits, not like the uh, current political class that uh, resigned lately that led us to the situation. And there is an urgency of a reform program. And finally, to be able to, uh, give, uh, to, to gain some time uh, to be able to do the reforms and to have the effect of all these reforms, there is an urgency for a financial stability package. This financial stability package will help us uh, uh, draw again or, or increase a little bit our reserves today to gain some time and to have the, uh, enough time to be able to do all the reform that we need and to restructure our economy and to restructure our country. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jean. Um, I'm going to ask one question to each of you, and I'm going to ask you to be very brief in your answers. Uh, very, very brief, because we have many people here and they want to ask questions as well. Uh, Makram, um, you said that the Lebanese people, the street in general, are not, or are not concerned what the U.S. is thinking, what this administration is thinking. But you also said that maximum pressure is working and the aid to the Lebanese army is working. So today, despite what the people's focus is, which is definitely internally, there's also a question here in Washington is like, what can be done and where the focus should be? More pressure? What kind of pressure? A different kind of policy? Uh, what do you suggest? Like, obviously, there is something to be done. What is what is what is it that you think need to be done at this point? Sanctions against Hezbollah must include its uh, Maronite allies. These allies, who are bullying the pe bullying people and using the last remaining uh, uh, constitutional institution uh, to stay in power. And here, I mean the Free Patriotic Movement 
and the most corrupt politician across the universe, Gibran Basile. We have said this. Once any sanctions are put on any of these Maronite politicians, people will think twice before declaring their support to Gibran Basile. People don't understand that this is not only a revolution for money. Uh, it is no coincidence that this revolution happened after two certain events took place. One of them was the forest fires that took place in Lebanon, which the uh, ruling establishment did not take action nor take responsibility for its shortcomings. And we saw the Lebanese across Lebanon come to the aid of their fellow brothers and sisters who were uh, uh, displaced. And thus, it proved that they don't need the government in order to take action. And more importantly, people who went to the bank to get their hard-earned money to pay their tuition for their kids or to simply uh, uh, pay their bills were prevented from doing so. And they were even insulted by these banks who had their discretionary authority and had these contracts that tells you that you cannot access your money. This is very much similar to the Abu Azizi case. Instead of burning themselves, they decided to burn this temple. It is working. Something has changed in Lebanon. People do not care about the international community because I said we are dealing with a new breed of politicians. Once in class, I gave this example about the invasion of Iraq. Then I noticed that these people weren't paying attention. Then when I asked him, when were you born? And the student told me 99. So he was only four years old when, when the invasion happened. We are dealing with a new, and this is not the millennials and social media and all of this. This is certainly something new. More importantly, these people are delusional. The political class in Lebanon are delusional. I know them personally. We've sat down with them. They talk to you and tell you, we, you don't know. We have information. They have nothing. They have the support of the international community who is afraid of vacuum and afraid of chaos. Nothing is worse than what we are experiencing at the moment. We are living a constant state of war with a political class who does not care about even providing for this clientelist system. This is why these people will, will hope. And there's something called the deep state. We do have a deep state. We do have the security apparatus doing their jobs. And more importantly, we have the local media is playing their game. And we have seen this personally and maybe Luqman. We don't go on local media because all of our messages are diluted and they don't let you name things as they are. So basically, this is not over. I'm not overly optimistic, but at the same time, something has been broken and they cannot put it back together. Okay, thank you, Makram. Uh, my question for you, Luqman, is you talked about how Hezbollah is responding on a small scale at this point using vi violence in Shia areas, what you call Shia Stan, and that they're not going to let go easily. But there is also this big question is whether Hezbollah is actually going to use their arms against the Lebanese street the way it's happening in Iraq. Do you think that this is a scenario? And if yes, what, can, what should we do? And if, if not, how else Hezbollah is going to respond? Briefly, please. Uh, very briefly, I will say that, of course, you know, using uh, their arms will always be a kind of uh, last resort. But personally, I think that uh, for the moment, uh, they will try uh, something else. It's exactly what they are trying to do right now, is to uh, give the impression or to impose a kind of normalization of the situation. For example, in the Shia area, they forced schools, universities, banks to reopen when the general strike was observed in uh, other Lebanese areas. So they tried to, uh, they are trying to expand this uh, scheme of normalization, be it through political contacts, uh, such as the meeting which took place yesterday between Hariri and Basile under the, uh, uh, thanks to the intercession of General uh, uh, Abbas, of the General Security, who is known to be very close to Hezbollah. So I think that they want to use now the coming weeks 
as a period uh, where they can lead, where they can count on the fatigue of the people and where they can continue waging their war of attrition against the most uh, active elements within the Shia milieu in particular and within the uh, general uh, uh, the, the, within the, the, the Harak, the uprising in general. However, let me tell you that you know, we saw also over the last week several uh, security manipulations taking place, such as uh, what we saw, for example, in Tripoli, where uh, several incidents, ambiguous incidents, happened between the Lebanese army and uh, some uh, people there. And uh, so there is uh, rumors that all this was in a way a kind of uh, infiltration from uh, Hezbollah's operatives. Uh, let me end saying that, yes, I fear uh, that Hezbollah will resort to violence, but not to the all-out violence such as the one that we see in Iraq and which is allowed by the fact that in Iraq Shia are killing Shia, but by provoking, I would say, uh, security incidents which could have a kind of uh, national impact. I don't know, reinventing uh, their own brand of Daesh or uh, reinventing uh, uh, a terrorist threat here or there. So they have a lot of tools in their toolbox, which are not necessarily the direct and manual violence exerted by uh, youngsters wearing black shirts. Thank you, Luqman. Um, Jean, I have a very uh, simple question for you. And uh, you, you, you gave a solution at the end, like what is needed to save Lebanon's economy and, and stability. But if this didn't happen, when do we expect the crash and what are the scenarios of that? Also, please, very briefly. <laughs> it's not easy to, to give really a timeline. However, what, what we can say again is how much foreign reserve do we still have and how much these of these reserves can be utilized, really? So basically, we, we, if we, we look at the, for, the utilized foreign reserve that we can use, we have around less than $10 billion to be able to, uh, uh, between our hands, so we can use them. These should be used, one, to be able to finance the deficit of the state. Two, to be able to, uh, uh, to answer all the withdrawals of the Lebanese citizens and the uh, uh, transfers of the Lebanese, that, the transfers that are being done uh, abroad, which, as we know now, banks are trying as much as, as they can to, to uh, put restrictions on this uh, and to, to keep as much as they can th these reserves. Three, they are being used as well in, in order to do the foreign uh, exchange currencies that is being done where people are exchanging or selling their Lebanese lira and buying dollars because they are scared of the Lebanese lira. So basically, if we, if we take all, and of course there are the maturing bonds and the maturing uh, euro bonds of Lebanon that should be rolled over. So if we take all these together and we try to assess uh, the utilized foreign reserve that we have, I don't think that, we can, that the reserves can last for more than three to four months without having any uh, and three to four months if we don't have any uh, uh, positive shock again I'm, I'm i'm saying if everything stays like like it is but any positive shock today any positive shock that can regain trust any positive shock that can uh, allow uh, the inflow of dollars to come back to the country and to allow the investors to come back to the country and to allow, and that's why I'm talking about a financial stability package that is urgently needed as well because this will allow us to have a new inflow of dollars in the country. All these positive shocks will allow us to, to, to gain some time and the time that we'll be uh, winning will be a time that where the reform that should be applied should be applied, and then to see a positive result in the in the shortest period as uh, as soon as possible. Okay, good to know. 
All right, we're going to start with your questions. Uh, I'm going to start with Joe, then Hussein, and if you want to ask any questions, just raise your hand. Joe, please. Joe Chibeli, Lebanese Information Center. So one quick question also for each. Makaram, th we, we've heard all from, calls from the political class, which you seem to appreci appreciate so much, but also from others saying, we need to have uh, representatives from the uprising or from the Thawra uh, to be able to have a dialogue. Do you, do you agree with that? And if this, uh, if this is possible, when do you think this will happen? Um, Lukman, regarding the, what you mentioned about the threats to the Shia communities, besides the, UNIFIL, the call for UNIFIL to assure this protection, which I think is a long shot, is there anything, anything else that, for example, uh, the U.S. can do with their uh, uh, role with the uh, LAF and others. And finally, Jean, we've, we, we had many calls to start the transfer um, or the uh, increase of the deposit of the diaspora in Lebanese banks and dollars, to transfer dollars as soon as possible. Um, but at the same time, there were some concerns that, that you know, the money that would be sent now would be spent <coughs> in not such a smart way. So do you think now is a good timing, or should we wait for the uh, new government and the reforms to happen? Thanks. Yes, Joe. Nice seeing you. Uh, to answer you, Joe, simply, no, I don't think that we should uh, put forward any of these names, and particularly just observing what's happening right now in Beirut. Uh, the political elite are trying to recruit people from the civil society under the premise that these people will be good ministers. This is not accurate. More importantly, they just need names so they could know who to issue the checks to. They want to buy us off like they did before. My personal experience in political parties as well as the civil society is that these people as, are as corrupt as the Lebanese political system, simply because the whole toxic environment leads to this corruption. They might have their heart in the right place, but they will only provide uh, political legitimacy to a political class that needs to field its own people. These political parties, and here I know that a lot of political parties, starting with your party, has put forward a lot of competent individuals who we can hold accountable. So I am not saying that we should get people from Mars to form this government, and I don't think, and this is a question that I've been asked many times, what do you want? I don't want anything. I'm simply a history professor who wants to go back and teach. If Saad al-Hariri and the remaining uh, people in, in office cannot field a, a, a roadmap for the transitional government and the transitional political system, they should have to retire, and then we can come in and provide these solutions. Uh, opportunism, as well as the fact that the, the regime, the existing regime, is trying to vet these politicians, these so-called aspiring politicians through contacting Abbas Ibrahim, Hezbollah's strongman and their intelligence guy in government, is one more reason why I stand opposite to this. In addition to the fact that uh, why should we cooperate with these people? They have not yet issued any statement that indicates that they're willing to play nice. On the contrary, they have started to form the, the government even before designating the prime minister. And more importantly, no one is willing to uh, to give any more legitimacy to Jibran Basil and his constant attempts to uh, to use puppets like Hariri or even to bring anyone who has credibility. And I know this because the Lebanese forces in particular have been trying to reform from the inside. This toxic system has to detox first, and then we can talk about a kind of cooperation between the civil society and whoever is in government. Okay. Hey, hi, Joe. No, uh, first, uh, I think that the answer to your question is very simple. We need to hear more and more from the U.S. and its friends that protecting protesters all over Lebanon is the responsibility of the LAF and other Lebanese uh, security institutions. And I highlight all over Lebanon, because what happened over the last three weeks, to go more into details, is that the army was, in a way, uh, over caring about the demonstrations in the north, 
by means of, in a way, hiding its failures, its uh, voluntarily failures in the South. So we need to hear more this message. We need perhaps to hear it uh, not only from the U.S., but to hear it uh, from uh, the in the UN because finally also the positions which were taken uh, by Mr. Guterres weren't uh, very encouraging. They put on equal footing, for example, uh, the protesters and the thugs of Hezbollah, though without naming them. Uh, but actually, I want to seize the opportunity to address a question to Jean and ask him, you know, this kind of financial stability that you are preaching, uh, will it uh, provide or not a kind of uh, pro bono lifeline to Hezbollah? Do we need finally to help Hezbollah, which is now suffering all these hardship by preaching such uh, an approach uh, to, to help Lebanon, quote unquote Lebanon. Okay, Jean, it, you have two questions now, so try to be as brief as possible. I'll be very brief. First of all, uh, hi, Joe, very nice uh, seeing you, to see you. Uh, so I'm going to. Uh, Can you raise, raise, raise your voice? We can't, we can't hear you, Jean. Okay, is closer it to the now? mic. Try again. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks. I really hope that I know where my mic is, but I don't know. Anyway, so I'm going <laughs> to just raise my voice. Uh, so, Joe, first of all, uh, as we said, any penny that is coming into Lebanon is important, and this initiative is is really interesting, especially from the diaspora, showing some uh, uh, that would like to help Lebanon that are abroad, and uh, and I can understand being abroad and seeing whatever is happening and wanted to contribute to this, and they want to help. However, you are completely right. Does this fund, if they come, and if the government, and if, like we are seeing today, uh, Hariri and Basile meeting together again and trying again to do a new uh, uh, test year or a new uh, deal. Uh, sorry? Deal. Consensus. Yeah, deal. a new yeah. deal. Uh, and, and go back to uh, to the same uh, system and the same way they used to manage this country. That, as I showed you in the in the presentation, the, if the if we are in this economic situation, it is because of this way of managing the country, and, and it is because of all the deals they are doing. So, if you are helping today, and here I'm I, I'm answering again, uh, I'm answering Lokman as well. Yeah. So, if this financial stability or any penny that is coming into the country will go in order to help and in order, in order to give some leeway and in order to give some, some uh, uh, breath to the current political class uh, uh, and Hezbollah, this will not help at all. On the contrary, this is, will, will, uh, will go for in vain and will go, we're going to continue in the same way and in the same problem. However, Lokman, the most important thing in, the, in this what we are asking for, we're not asking for a government where Hezbollah is, is, uh, is represented. Today, in order to be able, again, to gain the trust of the Lebanese people, and especially the international, international community, a government should be done of technocrats, a government without no political affiliations, a direct political affiliations, or answering to any political uh, agenda. This government has only two main objectives. One is the economic stability of the country. And there is an urgency in stabilizing the, economy, the, 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 the economic situation. And uh, the other one is eventually to answer to the, to the need of the people, because the people, they remove their trust in the current political class, and eventually to pre prepare for early election. So this, this government, why it is important for me to have this financial stability for a government where Hezbollah is not represented? Because if we can uh, uh, create this, uh, have this government in place of technocrats, working, believing in the reform that they are doing, and working day and night to implement these reforms, and to be held responsible of what they are doing, and having the trust of the international community through this financial stability package that will allow them to, to gain some time and to apply the reforms and to have a result. The Lebanese people will see the difference. 
when, Haz when Hezbollah is in the government, and, 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 and how much Hezbollah is, is affecting the, the, the economy, and how much Hezbollah is, is responsible of, of, is one of the responses, the responsible of the current economic situation, and when Hezbollah is not there, how things can go better. So I think this is an opportunity that we can have, and we should, we should, we should use it, and we should use it as a carrot, and, and pressure the current uh, negotiation that is happening in order to have a government that is, is, is able to, 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 to look like, like what I'm trying to, to, to represent. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, thanks, Jean. Uh, we have uh, two more questions. Hassan? Hassan. Um, I just, uh, the, the question is to, to the three of you. And uh, to my mind, uh, there's a known model in economics that's called guns versus butter. And this doesn't seem to be the part of any discussion in Lebanon. Uh, people just seem to think that the arms of Hezbollah is one thing and the economy is another. As long as there are arms, foreign investors and their dollars will not come to the country. That's easy. And no matter, n no amount of cabinet reshuffle will produce any positive results for the economy. Uh, my question to you is that is the people who are protesting now, do they understand this? Because my, my feeling is that they think that this is only corruption and administrative stuff. Do, do protesters now understand that the big elephant in the room is Hezbollah's militia with, and, and with the militia, there'll never be any uh, recovery that they can depend on? Thank you. Uh, Makram, uh, I think you should take this question. <coughs> yes, uh, to answer Hussein, uh, yes, people know this, but people are also scared. Uh, there's just a couple, couple of us in Beirut who have been very outspoken against Hezbollah for the last couple of years. Maybe Luqman has been doing it for uh, longer, but in my case, whenever I go off the air, I get calls from my family saying, what are you doing? Uh, we know that what you're saying is right, but you cannot say it. These people will hurt you. And I tell them simply, if I am in danger, everyone of you is in danger. And the elephant in the room is Hezbollah. And the people realize that this so-called uh, model of Hanoi and Hong Kong existing under the same roof, i.e. economic uh, prosperity, as well as an open, uh, uh, open state of warfare is not possible. However, the elephant in the room will be eaten step by step, small chunks. People are trying to more and more to expose Hezbollah for what they really are. Hezbollah is certainly not a political party. Hezbollah is a military and intelligence-minded organization. In his last speech, Hassan Nasrullah spoke about the importance of not blockading Hezbollah, particularly their access to the south of Lebanon. And this is what will be their downfall. They want an open military confrontation. And one thing which we need to start telling people is, first of all, you all know that the problem starts with Hezbollah, although they're not the only problem. We have a lot of issues which we need to address, but the politicians use Hezbollah just like Saad al-Hariri did on multiple occasions when he spoke to the international media that Hezbollah is a regional and an international problem. Hezbollah is our problem. These people sit across him on the cabinet table and they use the government and they use our banks to launder money. More importantly, we need to get people in this mindset, which I'm discussing this with Jean. First of all, there will be blood. But this will not be the end of Lebanon. We need to be able to take the first blow, and we did in Martyr Square. Second, we need to see who can take pain more in the sense that who can last longer. And I think the Lebanese can last longer than Hezbollah because Hezbollah are no longer only fighting in Lebanon. Hezbollah are the strategic consultants of terrorism for the Iranian revolution. They are deployed, they are depleted, and what's happening in Baghdad is certainly... Uh, affecting what's happening in Beirut and vice versa. And ultimately, the Lebanese have not yet publicly attacked Hezbollah because they know that this would simply cause violence or direct intervention by military means. But this doesn't mean that they don't know that they are actually complicit. And because they've seen how Rafi'il Hariri, sorry, Saad al-Hariri has basically through his uh, Faustin deal with the uh, with Gibran Basil has given uh, the country away to Hezbollah. They have went to the streets and said, "No, we will not accept this. We want to be part of the Arab uh, region, and thus to get this financial safety net that was provided to us previously under Rafi'il Harir." Joyce, Hanin, can I add one footnote to what uh, Makram said? Very small footnote. Very small footnote. 
A very small footnote. I think that first, and you are totally right saying to ask the question, but uh, and you are right uh, to say that. Uh, and Makram is right to say that people don't dare to see the elephant in the room, but all this should lead us to rethink what finally uh, this kind of fashionable concept of Lebanon stability. Perhaps after these 20 days of protests, after all what Hezbollah did, be it in Beirut, in Nabatiyya, in Sur, uh, after all the uh, pressure that Hezbollah put on the army, we need to come to the conclusion that finally preserving Lebanon's stability and fighting Hezbollah is an oxymoron. We cannot fight Hezbollah without putting Lebanon's uh, so-called stability at a certain risk. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah. Joyce. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Joyce Karam with The National. I actually have two questions uh, really quickly for you. The first, I mean, realistic, realistically speaking, if we see a new government, um, if that government works on uh, a new electoral law, uh, what kind of changes would you advocate in, in, in such uh, an electoral law to, to make sure that, you know, the, the protesters would, would feel represented and real change would happen? And my second question to the economic expert, John Tawil. Um, John Tawili, yeah. Tawili, yeah. Um, so you said three to four months in an event that this happens, that we, we do get to an economic collapse, and the Americans have said there will be no bailout for <laughs> Lebanon. Uh, so what scenario you see playing out? Are we looking at, I don't know, Venezuela? Or what are we looking realistically in, in, in Lebanon? Okay. Your first question was addressed to which speaker? Um, Makram? Yes, okay. So, Makram and then Jean? Well, yes, yes, Joyce. Uh, I think uh, we are falling in the trap, which usually, uh, you know, when you get used to, uh, to a certain rhetoric, you become, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's hostage. Uh, so we have been bombarded by the civil society with the idea of having an electoral law that uses proportional representation. And ultimately, what we got was a law drafted by Hezbollah. So opening this Pandora's box at this particular stage in time will certainly divide the revolution. Because unfortunately, the Christians are very touchy when it comes to electoral law, and we will have defections in the sense that the Christians have not yet realized that a more progressive, more modern uh, law uh, would protect them. Last time when I tried explaining the orthodox law, uh, which was peddled by, by the, by the F FPM, uh, normal Christians could not understand the fact that if they were, let's say, Maronite and their mom was was Catholic or was, for example, Protestant, they cannot, they, she cannot vote for them. And people said, no, this is not what we uh, wanted. This is just like similar to the Brexit. People voted for something, but they wanted something else. We cannot talk about any form of electoral reform without strengthening the judiciary, which uh, the FPM and Hezbollah now fully control. We cannot do any kind of uh, electoral reform without uh, security reforms. And we cannot particularly allow uh, for any kind of electoral reform when people don't understand that elections is not the only way to change, but really there is a number of issues, particularly in my, my own opinion is Article 95 of the Constitution of the Ta'if says that we have to uh, secularize the state gradually. This is something which the current political system will not do on its own. And more importantly, people don't realize that the Ta'if has been shot on the streets of Beirut. We should look, look for a new system, a system which protects us and takes us into the 21st century. Unfortunately, talking about elections now will be playing into the arms of the, uh, of the political establishment. And this is something I personally do not endorse. Jean? Yes. So uh, it's true that you still have like three to four months. However, we, are, we, we started to feel the problems. Uh, like what? First of all, traders cannot buy very easily goods anymore from abroad. So today there is a shortage of goods uh, in a lot of places in Lebanon. This will lead to hyperinflation, one. Uh, and again, 
Uh, there is this capital control or this disguised capital control until today that is happening, where people are finding a lot of difficulties to be able to, to, to take their, their money outside the country. And this obviously will stay like this. That's the first thing. Second, the government would default because there is no more money uh, with the banks to be able to finance the government. And as I said, 90% uh, of the Lebanese debt is held by the Lebanese banks. And for the last three years, only the Lebanese banks and the central bank were uh, lending the, 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 public sector, the public sector and the government. So if there is no more money, the government would, would default. By, by defaulting, you will obviously and, and automatically go to a haircut. Uh, they will have to, 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 to do a haircut on their bondholders. The bondholders are the banks. The banks will have to apply this on their depositors, and then we will see another scenario as we, we, we saw in, in other countries like in Cyprus or others. So uh, the whole country will be in a, in a very bad situation. They won't be able to, 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 to keep uh, the, the, the peg in the Lebanese lira, even though today it's all, it started not to, to, like I already said in the presentation that we already have, an unofficial secondary, secondary market in the Lebanese lira. However, this unofficial will become official as well. And this will also lead to the inflation and the hyperinflation that we have. And yes, we can see a scenario at uh, like Venezuela or, uh, or other country, uh, even, even worse than Venezuela, because we don't, we, have to, we, we, we don't have to forget that Lebanon is not until today an oil producing country and they don't have enough revenues. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the, the scenario might be very catastrophic, and uh, I really hope that we won't go into this. Now, just uh, between brackets, uh, some people in the government still hope that if we can hold until two or three months, uh, we would eventually uh, have the result of, uh, of the first extraction of oil and gas, of the gas, of the offshore gas that we have. Uh, the offshore gas that will be the, the, the drilling will start next month in December end of December the drilling will start and whether the uh, the, the exploration is is financially uh, uh, exploitable and it makes sense financially we could have an answer within February if we have really luck and a lot of a lot of people in the current government or the uh, or the people the political class actually are, are really uh, hoping and they are really betting on finding some positive result in this in order to reestablish trust. Uh, I don't know, I hope I answered your question. Okay, we have one more question because we still have eight more minutes. So we'll take one last question and then I will conclude. Please go ahead. Can Hi, you introduce uh, yourself? Yes, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Sylwia Szablowska. I'm an assistant defense attaché for Poland. Uh, Poland, as you may know, has just re-entered Unifil mission uh, after 10 years. So it's quite interesting for me to hear your ideas about uh, revisiting Unifil mission. Uh, the question, two very quick questions. Uh, how does uh, the situation affect uh, Syrian refugees? That's the first question. And the second one is, uh, do you see already some foreign regional players like Tur Turkey, Russia, Israel, trying to affect or take advantage of what's happening, whatever you, you know, your observations are. Thank you. Who are you asking this question to? Which speaker? Whoever. Who wants to take this? Makram? <laughs> yes. The issue, the issue of the refugees, I think, uh, uh, this xenophobia that has been waged, waged by Jibran Basile to try to scare the, the Lebanese by reminding them that these uh, uh, refugee camps can be transformed into militia fighters and stuff is unfounded. I think one of the, uh, the last sources of income for the Lebanese, particularly in the regions, are these refugees who are spending money, who have food coupons, and who are being uh, used as cheap labor. Uh, ultimately, uh, uh, the, the refugees now are laying low, and uh, this xenophobic rhetoric has died down, at least for the first uh, 15 days of the revolution, up until our uh, foreign minister, uh, Jobran Goebbels, decided to try to use it again uh, in, his last, uh, in his last talk. 
I don't think that people are uh, will will buy any kind of trying to scare people by using refugees because this is a completely different thing. And more importantly, uh, Russia tried on a number of occasions to become a, a player in Lebanon. They can't. They just they are too security and intelligence minded people to play the politicians. They they don't have boots on the ground in Syria, and this is something that Hassan Nasrallah. In his in his latest in his last interview, Manar mentioned so trying to contain Iran and trying to play a role. It has just some friends. One of these friends who is only symbolic is Walid Jumlat, and he cannot provide any kind of maneuvers. Uh, as for Israel, I think they're uh, they have their own problems with Netanyahu, and uh, I think they know that any t- kind of intervention here would actually uh, explode in their face, knowing that Jibran Basil is trying to use. We had an incident a couple of uh, a month ago where we had someone returned from Virginia or from, from, I don't know where, but he was in the States. He returned to Lebanon and he was the warden of the concentration camp that the South Lebanon army used to operate under Israeli occupation. So now we have a feeling that Hezbollah will go back to attacking this person who is now incarcerated by the Lebanese authorities in order to empower these factions who are represented by Jibran Basil and these so-called Lebanese rightists who use every opportunity to try to, to use the idea of the alliance of minorities against the so-called Sunni scare, be it the Alawites, the Maronites, the Jews, or even uh, anyone else who's willing to join. So I don't think people are aware. People have been immunized through a number of encounters with this political class, and they know, they know how uh, the kitchen operates because simply they were cooks in these kitchens. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. But most importantly, uh, Makram, Luqman, and Jean, uh, stay strong and definitely be safe after this. Thank you, Hanyi. Uh, thank you very much for speaking thank to you. us. This thank has you. been very insightful. Thank you all for coming. Please join me. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everyone.